It's not business as usual. You can't bank, get insurance. You can't use PayPal or Square. It's not like being able to set up a business and run. I had 11 businesses before that. I was like, I got it. Ain't nobody better than me. So, and beyond that, in education, you have to have training and systems. This is new. So to set people up for success, this is why we ended up franchising the model. I mean, we have training when they come in to sign up with us. We show everything. They actually stay and lodge on the farm. They eat food that we grow on the farm that we have in our pharmacy. They visit manufacturing, distribution. They learn the process because that is the best way to deliver anything to people. And so when it's so new and all over the internet, because it's unregulated, you can see and read anything you want. Well, why not learn where we back it up? This is The Dime. Dive into the cannabis and hemp industry through trends, insights, predictions, and tangents. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of The Dime. I'm Brian Fields, and with me, as always, is Kellen Finney. And this week, we've got a very special guest, Franny Chasey, founder of Franny's Pharmacy. Franny, thanks for taking the time. How are you doing today? I am fantastic, and what a pleasure to be here with you, Brian and Kellen. We're really excited to dive in. Kellen, how are you doing? I'm doing really good. I'm excited to, to talk to Franny, and we were chatting for the show, and we are both uh, shared the same uh, alma mater at NAU, so a little shout out to my, to my alma mater, and uh, you know, you let's, wanna... go, let's go, let's <laughs> go. Well, hold on. Before we kind of dive in, Franny, it's really important before we get started, just your current location as it stands right now. What state are you in? I am in North Carolina, Asheville, North Carolina. So they, another East Coast. Another East Coast. Is that Coast where you're going with that? Is That's that exactly going? what I was going for. On the record, another East Coaster. You guys may share an all matter, but the East Coast it is. Yes, sir. So, so Franny, before we dive in, it'd be great for our listeners to get a little background about you and how you got into the space. Yeah, it's really a lifetime of a story, but I was in pharmaceuticals. I went to forestry school at NAU back, way back about 30 years ago and um, ended up in pharmaceutical career. So from there, I always said farm at a farm, unhealthcare industry. I bought my farm 10 years ago, way before uh, hemp was even on the radar. And then in 2017, we went, we had gone through years of trying to get an industrial hemp pilot program. I ended up being the first female farmer to plant hemp, even though I was still in pharmaceutical career. So it took a few years and that's pretty much how I transitioned and now have vertically integrated operations from farming to manufacturing, distribution and franchising. So before we kind of expand on some of those, I love the the concept of pharma to farm. Can you kind of share a little bit about more about specifically what that means? Sure. So almost 15 years in pharmaceuticals and the nickname that has stuck with me is the hippie in high heels, or they called me the anti-drug rep. So um, always been very, very involved in the health and nutrition side of everything. You know, I just kept it first, it was farm at a farm and there's a whole blog and story about it. And that's when my TED talk came out. You know, I was trying to get out of pharmaceuticals and really get in the real healthcare industry. And that's where my heart and passion has always been. And in the first year I grew, it was actually for food and fiber until I figured out there is not a market for that. And there's not one coming soon and really dug in and started learning about CBD the, on the med- medical side, and that's what's legal here. And so that's where we got started. Was there any hesitation to go from pharmaceutical to hemp? Obviously, given your location and then the industry moving from pharma to, to the hemp industry, was there any kind of hesitation or backlash when you made that transition? Well, there's not any hesitation on my part. I had just been waiting, but there was a little bit of backlash. But in a way, so much support. I mean, that's still part of the reason we were successful is all the physicians send them, send their patients to us. Uh, to be able to have a trusted, reliable, high quality. But I mean, by all means, there's, I mean, we had DEA flying over our farm and we had people, you know, we had to put up surveillance. Nobody knew what was going on because I was the first in North Carolina, but North Carolina was only the fifth state to grow. So I was on the news all the time. We even had Vice TV here. People were like, what are you doing and why are you so out there? You know, um, even my family. I mean, we're from the South. I have a family of Episcopal ministers and engineers. Okay, so they are so sweet and kind and supportive, but 
even that they were like, oh, I don't, am I going to get high using this? What's going on? I'm like, it's a topical. You're good. But, you know, my, my first degree, I have a master's in education and a PhD coursework at Smithsonian Institute. So putting that education behind all of this was super, super important to me. And, you know, that's, yeah, but I mean, I'd still under scrutiny. I, if I cared what other people thought, we wouldn't be talking today. I'm, I'm glad that you shared that, especially given your location. So have you seen kind of a shift like from when you got started to kind of now where people have kind of opened up to the concept that have been more acceptable to the potential opportunities that hemp brings and, and some, some of the benefits that it provides? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we're really blessed because our market and a lot of people that come to us are people that are being referred. So by doctors and physicians and people that they trust, it's a little bit different from, you know, like, uh, say, a smoke shop or something where somebody would go in. You know, we are very, very focused on health and wellness in all aspects. And the interesting enough, our market population is about 50-50 women to men. And also, like, ages 35 to 65. So there's been a huge awareness and we're just a place where people can trust that it's okay to go into and learn. So, yeah. I have a question. Has Was um, Epidiolex and kind of that whole movement in like the mid 2015 to like 2018, did that have a, did that play a role in kind of your transition from pharma into the hemp industry at all? Um, good question. I actually knew about all of that when it went into research trials when I was buying my farm. So seven oh, so years ten, before wow. anybody ever knew about it, I was in pharma and I was like, oh, finally, finally, they're starting to do research on this. And I had a young son then. I mean, he was in his early teens and so very impressionable and so forth. And, you know, and an athlete, he's actually a world-class athlete or half Iron Man's. I love it. <laughs> and so he's never really been huge into cannabis and part of the propaganda. And I was always trying to teach him the reality of this. Um, but I marked then, I said, watch, in seven years, we're going to have our first pharmaceutical drug with cannabis in it. And yeah, that's what makes me so good in business. I see the future. Well, then I'm going to have to ask, <laughs> what's going to happen in seven years from now? Uh, well, in seven years from now, we will absolutely, cannabis will be deregulated, legal, and uh, it's going to be just like 10 years ago when I was talking about GMOs and nobody knew it. It's going to just be everywhere in our normal society, and it will have, it, it's just, that's where we're going to be in seven years. Completely agree. I know I want to go back. I apologize for kind of jumping ahead. I got excited when you made that. Uh, I, I really like that you had a focus on education. I think that's so important, just given all the challenges geographically and some some of the information that, that's hard to know. And I was on your website and, and I saw the focus on education. One of the areas that I really, really enjoyed was the quiz aspect where it allowed you to kind of not necessarily get your hands held through the process, but kind of go through the steps that you would have to kind of walk through that. So is that a big opportunity for you where users come into your website and they feel comfortable doing that and sharing information? You can make the recommendation. Can you kind of shed more light on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and also, let me say, in Asheville, we were the first city in all of the United States to deregulate and remove CBD from our restricted medications list. And this is all because I'm a researcher and scientist when it really comes down to it. Education is huge. We're very limited in what we can actually say. So the quiz allows the person to engage and help them understand what are they looking for? Why are they doing this? Hugely successful. And at the end, we give the first customer a 20% off coupon to try the products that they have gone through the discovery to learn. But really more important on the education, two of our franchise owners are pharmacists. And trust me, a pharmacist is only going to the best and highest quality place. This next weekend, like in our grand opening, we have a new corporate office training center for franchisees in Asheville. And with that grand opening, uh, we have doctors, pharmacists, nurses. We are constantly doing panels to connect people, especially when it comes to children. 
it's, you know, with experts that they can talk to to help find what is right. It's customized. It's a healthcare product, just like anything else. It's, it's going to react different in everybody's bodies and actually pharmaceuticals do too. We're individuals. So we have to help the individuals. And that's what it's really all about, right? The only way I make money is to help other people. So, 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 so important. So let's talk about the franchises. How does that work? That's new to me. I've never heard anyone in the space doing that. Kellen, I'm curious if you have, Brittany, can you share a little bit about the franchising? Absolutely. So it took me forever. I mean, not forever. It took so long, so many challenges to figure this out. And there was nobody to help me along the way. I was the first. Nobody. And so um, in all of this, again, the only way I succeed as a human and as a business person is to help other people. So as I discovered this and as I build relationships, it's all about collaboration to make this available to other people. This is so new in the industry. The more is more is more. It's all better. So it's not business as usual. You can't bank, get insurance. You can't use PayPal or Square. It's not like being able to set up a business and run. I had 11 businesses before that. I was like, I got it. Ain't nobody better than me. So, and beyond that, in education, you have to have training and systems. This is new. So to set people up for success, this is why we ended up franchising the model. I mean, we have training when they come in to sign up with us, we show everything. They actually stay and lodge on the farm. They eat food that we grow on the farm that we have in our pharmacy. They visit manufacturing, distribution. They learn the process because that is the best way to deliver anything to people. And so when it's so new and all over the internet, because it's unregulated, you can see and read anything you want. Well, why not learn where we back it up? It's not, this is seeing is believing here. And, you know, we've all made it through COVID. It was really, and now we're set to explode again. We have an amazing franchise design model that incorporates hemp wood and sustainable building materials. I mean, the farmers that are growing that were part of the farm research that I helped start years ago. It's amazing. It's so integrated. There is not one step. It is so big, so huge. Nobody can do this alone. So we have the executives, the support team, franchise support, and everything figured out so that we bring people in. And they're still overwhelmed and we're telling them what to do. It's a lot. It is super a lot. But we got to set people up for success. You know, we look over 95% of every dispensary that opened has closed. You know, they don't realize that there's banking issues or that PayPal is going to keep $16,000 that they took from us and never returned. You know, it's a lot. So success, helping, again, helping others, that's really what it comes down to. So important. And as you perfectly said, it's humbling, right? The the ability to say, I've done this before, I can figure this out. And then you you kind of dive into the space and you're like, what is happening here? Oh, yeah. I tell everybody, listen, I fail forward all the time because in all my franchise knows we run all the pilots for new products and R&D and everything at corporate before we roll it out to them. And I was like, oh, if there's a mistake to be made, I am the risky one to do it. That's what I do. And that's what makes me, now that's why I speak all over the country too. I'm like, hey, I'm going to tell you, I know exactly what to do and what not to do. And I'll tell you both and you can choose whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, that's a fair way of describing it. Kellen, I, I want you to kind of come in here from a franchising standpoint, how valuable that must be to have a partner like Franny kind of walk through some of these operators, especially getting started. We've had conversations with people who are wide eyed and think, hey, I've done X, Y, and Z before, you know, this transition will be seamless. And what it's found out, it, it's been a little harder than they anticipate. So kind of expand on that. Yeah, no, completely. I mean, there's so many mistakes we made in this space. And a lot of people <laughs> who have successfully run other businesses come to the space with their spreadsheets. And they're like, look how much money I'm going to make. Like this cell over here is going to do this. And then they get in, get involved. And it's just a completely different world. It's like the wild, wild west, right? Like it's not regulated. Like you're trying to do the right thing and you're almost shooting yourself in the foot from a business perspective. And so having a partner from a franchise perspective to lean on is a first that hasn't 
at least from my knowledge, hasn't been available to anyone else trying to get into the space. And it sounds like this isn't your guys' first rodeo. I mean, there's multiple iterations of learning. And so, Franny, kind of talk us through the process of the first time you guys started educating people to where you are now and like how big of a hill was that to climb from uh, changing the iterations of teaching people and how, how everything kind of changes on the fly in the, in the industry right now. Uh, yeah, I like to refer to it as dynamic. That <laughs> That's a good word. <laughs> every damn day, you're going to wake up and something's different, you know? <laughs> and from growing to, I mean, every single step along the way, it has been amazing and interesting, even from when we took our first crops to make our first distillates and isolates and products to where we are now and how even this, you know, We have an alchemist that's been working with us in our products, but in order to take my crop that I grew to market, I was like, oh, goodness. I had to bring in a chemist, and I call him an alchemist because he's so high vibe and um, evolved, to be working through all this stuff. And now, what does that look like? So um, I helped start a a nonprofit, Women in Hemp. The executive director of that came from the bottled water industry. Everybody thought she was crazy. We knew that these nano solubles, water solubles at the beginning were a joke. We're the ones testing that stuff. All that stuff, if it's not emulsified, it cleans to the outside. There's no testing. It's unregulated. 80% of the drinks out there with CBD are ineffective. And my franchisees want to have those drinks. So trying to explain to them, like, the research doesn't back it up. You know, when D8 became hot, I'm like, great. We were out there and we test everything. And I was like, y'all have pesticides in this. So let me tell you this. We tested 131 D8 products. You know how many passed the test of not having pesticides, heavy or heavy metals? Can we guess? Or mold. Yes, guess. Two. Zero. Three. Oh, you were close. You want to know who the three were? They were associated in our grower network. Because when we set up our three-year trial at the beginning, which I'm not having to deal with the, you know, the farming aspect of it anymore. You know, we have a hemp history tour and a garden here on our farm. But it was the liability of being a public space and growing was we had to move grow elsewhere. And that was part of the women in hemp, the researchers. It's all under another program that's monitored under NC State now. I don't even have to worry about that. But because of that, that led to, we didn't, we weren't the first to release D8. We weren't the first, but we are the best because we're one of the few that can say, guess what? You want to smoke that and have that variety from our bud bar? You're not smoking pesticides or heavy metals. So those are just a few examples of kind of what's coming to light right now. We're in research. I have researchers and we have chemists and we have testing and that's what we do. So we don't need to be first everywhere. We always need the best, trusted, highest quality. And if it's not one thing, it's another. So, you know, that's a, that's a rabbit hole we could go down for a long time. I was going to say, it's, that's got to be, I mean, it's got to be shocking to you coming from pharma to be like, and not seeing this as like standard in the industry. Because I mean, the amount of tests that pharma does is even more obnoxious, right? Oh, yeah. And so my rotation, I did rotations every year. And my favorite was manufacturing. So again, like in forestry school, they didn't have a sustainable agriculture back then. So it's pretty much I had a Bachelor of Science with Forestry and Ecology. I mean, I'm used to having microscopes and nerdy magnifying glasses on and looking at it. I love that stuff. And I've got to be able to back it up. I'm one of the few brands out there that has a person. My name is on every product, every company, everything I do. And so it is, there's nothing to hide behind. There's no anything else. I take responsibility for everything. And so when my name's on it, we're just going to be OCD about everything. As you should, there's a trust and expectation when it comes with brands and positioning where when someone sees, you know, your logo and your name, there's an expectation behind that of quality and and safety that you have to stand behind as the, the face of the brand, which 
is like another layer of challenge. So from a franchising standpoint, can you kind of expand on how that would work? Do they get an opportunity to license the, the Franny brand or is it more of the operational expertise? Where, how does the franchising actually work? So I'm glad you asked that. At the beginning of this year, um, it hit the press everywhere when I, it, it's actually, I'm celebrating my one year of taking over as CEO because the, because of some of the values that were in conflict, I bought my partner out. And the first thing I did was release the revival of retail and the franchise model and went through all software development and program to give our franchisees that all have brick and mortar locations. And we've just been through two years of COVID and retail is, is tough. 10% of online sales. We created unique URLs and QR codes that so they begin to function more as an independent, but yet they have the entire franchise support. So the more they send to e the more money they can make there. We diversified their income stream, which is genius. So I had boards only telling me they would do live interviews. They would not send me questions or do anything in advance. So I declined that based on my attorneys and publicists. Sure. But spoke everywhere, got picked up everywhere because that is what we're doing in this company. We are creating, we're coming out of a new era. I'm super progressive. I live in one of the most liberal towns. Nobody, nobody's idea of work is the same. How do we empower people? This year, we're restructuring the company um, internally so that next year we eventually become an employee-owned company. Who better to run the business? I pick the leaders. I choose the leaders and eventually it becomes employee-owned. And that extends even to our franchise. So it is progressive. It is future. I have love earlier. You were saying, do people love you or are you under scrutiny? Both. And some people have both. You know, they're like, what are you doing? And this is genius. And you are crazy. Yes, all of it. All of it. And the franchisees are right now, we're in our core group and they know this is how we build our business like a plant, growing it with roots. I have a question. I, yeah. Can uh, if your franchisees carry other brands? Do you encourage that? How, or if they have like a new product idea, do they come to you? How does that whole dynamic work? Yeah, well, we do not at any means carry a competitive brand because I do not believe there is any brand out there that could compete with us. And we are a brand. I like it. But on that note, there are certain things that we do carry that are, we have amazing collaborating partners. We don't get all, we buy all our flour from farmers, no brokers. Again, part of our values and mission. Drinks, it doesn't make sense for us to distribute drinks. They're heavy, they're breakable, la la la. So franchisees have independent relationships with their drink vendors, although there's often the same. Arcana Cafe has brought in some things and we do have, different collaborators that have products that we do not. And I'm not going out there to white label a product and say, hey, I did this. We collaborate with them. So there's some co-branding um, opportunities. And our franchisees are definitely the ones, listen, they're hot on it. They want the next new shiny object every day, all the time. And I'm like, we're working on it. Y'all know it's got to go through R&D. So that's what's exciting about the launch of Arcana Cafe. It's been an R&D for six months. All the different foods, all the different trials. We have our, you know, 22 person group here in Asheville that does all the analysis. Then we have other ones that's just the taste retail side of it. Um, so there's really fun collaborations in that that are happening with different people supplying our ingredients. We have Victory Hemp that we work with. So it's more about collaborations instead of competitive products. There's just no reason. And it just is super exciting. We've got 24 new products that we're launching this year. We just trademarked our new um, molds for our gummies, which are super branded to Franny's Pharmacy, really high end and vegan, all natural. You know, gummies out there, people love gummies and they're so full of crap. I'm like, why is somebody putting that in their body? It has red food coloring in it. For God's sakes, we're still supposed to be health and wellness, no matter what. So we use spirulina and beet juice and turmeric and these great things to, to produce a great product that can actually be health and wellness. 
Can so you that's just, a long just, answer to your question. <laughs> can we just expand on Kind of Cafe, you know, what that is so that our listeners have some context? Yes, it's um, super exciting because the first time I grew hemp, it was for food. So our Canna Cafe, when we launch our first phase one, is the baked goods with teas. We have a whole chakra tea blend. So that goes from that. We have coffee and a great baked goods. So some of them have CBD in it and some of them do not. They are using hemp flour, hemp seeds, hemp milk. And one of the favorite inciting things that will roll out at the end of Q1 is pasta and prana, one of the divisions of Franny's Farm Foods that's creating hemp pasta. So we have a gluten-free hemp gnocchi with a dinner theater that's an educational dinner theater with all these New York actors that are in it. It's so genius. We're going to have one on coming up and to launch a bunch of the new food stuff to put the education in it, but make it fun. Fun, fun, fun. So Canna Cafe is teas, coffee, baked goods, scones, cookies. We have hemp nugs that are super nutrient dense. So these are actually health and wellness foods that taste good. And it's exciting. And pasta and sauces are all coming soon. We have a Franny's Fettuccine uh, partner. Oh, it's so delicious. (laughs) And it's vegetarian too. No eggs in it for the binding because hemp protein is so nutrient dense and has so much protein that it is the binder and you don't need eggs. So you can make amazing things gluten-free and vegan. You're making me so hungry right now. How, how, okay, I, I got to back up. I have some questions. How, how does this work? Right, Kellen, I'll ask you first, right? Like, what's going on here? Like, I, I have an understanding of hemp, but like, how do we incorporate into food? Like Franny's saying, can you kind of give some more context on that? I mean, I'll let Franny take over from here because, like, I cook with HelloFresh, if we're going to be honest. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Eligible bachelor. Chef, yeah, right? Shout out. (laughs) So I'll let Franny explain the the actual process of incorporating the hemp into it. But it's the hemp hearts, right, Franny? Is that the, the part? Yeah, that is actually it. And there's so much amazing education that we're putting around this because people don't understand that the female plant is the one that creates all the beautiful medicinal buds. And throughout yeah. ancient history, actually the men would grow it, but as soon as it, they harvested, they were no longer allowed to touch this beautiful female plant as it got transitioned into the medicine. So the female plants are short and bushy and they produce these green buds. And that's what we're using for all the medicinal stuff. We press it, use it for oils, make distillate and everything for all our products. The male plant is tall and straight and has a big cola on the end of it that starts with a bunch of little white balls that turn into seed. That does not have CBD in it, but it has a ton of omegas. It is super rich, nutrient-dense protein food like many other seeds. So they harvest that top cola with all the seeds in it, take the seeds and use seeds, and then send it through a processing in each stage, it gets finer. So you end up with like a farina, kind of a cream of wheat texture, and then you end up with a flour, F-L-O-U-R. So that's what all the food is made out of. No CBD, but super nutrient rich and dense um, health food. So there's so much that, I mean, that's the biggest thing. People are like, I'm confused. Hemp oil for cooking and hemp oil for medicine and There's so much and so very exciting as we're building all our assets in Q2, there will be a huge Franny's Farm Foods launch and expect a lot more education to come into this because foodies love this. And I'm glad you you broke that down because I think it's so important to separate that information and to explain for others because, you know, I'm hearing that and and I believe I understand, but hearing you separate it makes a ton more sense and it's really clear the the benefits of the differences in the plant. So continuing on that path, industrial hemp, thoughts on that becoming more of a mainstream style product? Yeah, absolutely. It's the same thing that I was talking about before in the contrast, which everybody should understand since we live in the most extreme contrast ever. So industrial hemp is very different from horticultural hemp. I say it's the difference between horticulture, which is small, managing a plant, Um, And that's what we do with the female plant and on the medicinal side of it. And then mass agriculture, 
agriculture is the industrial. So how do we bridge those? There is so many trials that we've been involved in that are allowing us to bridge the medicinal into industrial. Uh, right now, it's been very, very difficult to get the quality and industrial is field grown. It's outside. So think too about these large farmers that are interested in it. They have no grant money, no government money, no state funding. It's all on their own dime to figure out or transition. So they're not, and you can't grow a food product. You cannot grow a medicinal product. There is no way you can ever grow the hemp on contaminated soil. It, we have grown it on organic soil where it has still come back with pesticides or heavy molds from our rain, from the water system, that is not able to ever go into an adjustable product. So industrial hemp, we will see, will end up being fiber. It's the next model that's growing in, in hemp and in cannabis. So this is why we have a Franny's fashion too, and a Franny's foods. But all food and all medicinal stuff, to get to the industrial capabilities, has to be grown on good soil because it's a bioremediator and hemp is going to pick it all up. So we'll see fiber and textiles and rope and building materials. That's what's going to emerge the industries out of industrial hemp. This is why some of the first people that have been involved with it, we were buddies growing together when nobody else did, are our partners, and we are a dealer for hemp wood, an amazing example of industrial hemp for the entire community within 95 miles is growing a product to be produced in this manufacturing. Kellen, I know you're a big industrial hemp fan. You want to kind of uh, take that? I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan of it. I think that there's just so many benefits to the human society uh, kind of pivoting away from more from crops that require more resources and don't yield as many applications, I guess, right? Like cotton, takes up yep. a ton of land and we kind of just make clothes out of it, right? Versus if you replace that same amount of land with industrial hemp, you would not only be able to generate fiber for those clothes, but you'd also get what's called herd. So it's like the center of the hemp stock, right? The fiber is like the outside of it. If you've ever seen a weed stem and you've been picking off little fibers, the fiber that makes clothes, it's on the outside of the stem of a, of a large hemp plant. And then the inside is like, hollow wood, but there's a specific ratio of like air inside of that wood that creates a high R value, which is your the way that we measure insulation, right? And I'm getting there. <laughs> but like when you take that and make say hemp wood or even like hempcrete now is another popular building medium for it, it creates this product that has such a high R value so then you don't need to then go and use fiberglass and generate all these other toxic chemicals to insulate the house, to make it energy efficient. So there's a ton of just nuanced benefits associated with the plant that people haven't even haven't even started to, to scratch the surface of from uh, helping humanity, if you will. It is so astounding. And so listen, we release our design article coming up soon. And it's gonna, it, we have videos about exactly what you were talking. How do we get to a hemp wood product that you're using in building materials? And another thing, you're gonna love this too, is carbon sequestering. We have major issues. I mean, we can reverse this stuff. Talking about research geek, I love this stuff. I love, it. that's part of the heart and soul of farming and what, how our farmers are going to save our world Agreed. because it's not just here. We're going to return one day to the value of everybody recognizing and honoring farmers, which right now they are the poorest in this country. They are the unhealthiest in this country. They work the most. They work so much and it is a labor of love. And I can assure you as much as I have on my farm and everything I've ever done as a passion when I worked through pharmaceuticals and was feeding chickens every morning and goats. And, you know, it is, it is truly a labor of love and for everybody. It is also a labor of service for the collective because we are saving environments and soils and continuing to do something. It's going to be very interesting. This is the first year we've had a farm census in five years. And what we've seen in the last 50 years is that now 
we went from like 50% of farms being owned by individual people and families to now six, 6%. We have lost our farm because it's is, not it's hard. <laughs> what is one hemp statistic or fact that would shock an everyday person? I think knowing that there's 450,000 plants, cannabis is the only one that provides Cannabis, when consumed by a human with 300 cannabinoid receptors that fit together. 450,000 other plants out there. And cannabis is the only one that has what was made and designed in however we were created for plants and animals in our community and everybody, everything to live together that fits in the human body. That shows we were born to be together, humans and cannabis. The walk and key. What research that you have said re- or read about or anticipate reading about in the next, let's say, three to five years gets you most excited? Oh, most excited? I love all the research. Got to choose so one favorite. The, <laughs> so along the way, what we we're already finding out is there was only CBD. And now already in these past few years, we have are identifying all these individual cannabinoids <laughs> So I love the entire fact of the research is isolating each cannabinoid, finding out what it means as an isolate on on its own, and then putting it back together to see how it reacts better with its, you know, other parts to create, we are creating an entirely new healthcare system. So I can't even pick one. It's just the cannabinoid research as we continue to isolate these. Since you've been in the cannabinoid industry, what has been the biggest misconception? Oh, gosh. Well, it's because I'm involved in so many. I think one of the biggest misconceptions is everybody figures that I'm rich being in this industry. You know, that's why everybody's getting into it. And that's why 95% of the businesses have failed. Damn money. It's because Agreed. they don't realize any business is grows like a plant. You got to have roots. You just There's no get rich quick scenes here. Unfortunately. If, if only. If only. <laughs> if only. I know. Before we do predictions, we ask all of our guests, if you could sum up your experience into a main takeaway or lesson learned to pass on to the next generation, what would it be? Plants and plant medicine are true healthcare, And that is our future to open your minds, research, heart, pockets to support real health care and real wellness. We've got a a long way to go. That is so well said. Well said. All right, prediction time. Franny, five to seven years from now, what will CBD and hemp franchising look like? It's going to be very, very normal. I expect that Franny's Pharmacy is going to be a internationally recognized brand. Right now, we have international connections, but it's not necessarily legal there yet. And that this will be a global, global opportunity that we have led. And it is not, everybody's going to want to get in. It's not going to be as affordable as it is right now to take the risk. It's going to be standard. And what you'll see with Franny's Pharmacy is that we are an enterprise for hemp as we integrate food and fiber and everything into our dispensary models. It's not just going to be medicinal. All of the industry that we are creating will catch up to bring a lot more products into the market. We will see every major every major brand and retailer bringing hemp in some way to be a part of their product line because it will be norm. It will be the norm in about seven years. Five years, I think that right in between five to seven is going to be that next shift. And Franchise is going to be normal. It'll be normal. And you won't see as many of the mom and pop. Not as, I mean, CBD is everywhere now. That It will be regulated and they're going to take it out of the gas stations so that people can't go in and find stuff that's cheap, that's filled with shit. Literal. You can get feces in any of this stuff. I mean, birds fly over these crops. I mean, so we still got a long way to go. But in five years, we've already seen 38 states have uh, legalized marijuana. So that's going to be part of this as well. Killing. Five to seven years from now. 
Uh, I agree. I think that it's going to be standard. And I think that unfortunately for a lot, a lot of law and ba uh, shops that are kind of just trying to stand on their own and there to weather their little storm. Um, I don't think they're going to make it. I think that it is going to be adopted by the CVSs and the Walgreens. I mean, even right now, Walmart, right? If you're in a certain state, you can go to Walmart and you can buy hemp herd that is cat litter, right? So there's hemp cat litter out there that Walmart is selling currently. So there's the product skew at these large established companies that are only going to increase. And so I believe that it's it's going to be interesting to see the dynamic between companies that got involved early versus the companies that are going to come and get involved post normalization, if you will, which I think Randy is right on the hit the nail on the head in terms of that timeline of being like five to seven years. Right. And so that is going to be a really interesting consolidation event, if you will, where say CBS doesn't want to build out an entire product line. They're going to come in and purchase an existing company would be my guess. Um, That's my prediction. What do you think, Brian? I think with franchises, you have right the pros and the cons. And I think when you're evaluating a business and and you're maybe a little more reluctant to a franchise, you have to think about the massive benefits that come with it. The educational aspect, the fact that Franny's likely failed the bazillion and a half times, which has led her database of information to be extremely helpful so that the new franchisee doesn't have to make those same mistakes. And I think that some of the operators we've spoken with that have maybe taken those wrong turns, if they would have taken the franchise path and worked with you, Franny, they likely would have saved themselves, you know, tons of headaches and financial burdens in those mistakes. Because like you were saying, Franny, it's so costly for the farmers. And to make those decisions, you don't sometimes get a second chance. And, you know, understanding that is a really big challenge, especially as everyone kind of gets that wide-eyed approach as they they want to rush into the space. And At the end of the day, you have to make sure that you've got the right capital investment, but you also understand the path forward is going to be challenging. Yeah, I think you hit on a really important thing there that we haven't really discussed, which is the community, right? If you're just out there on your own and you run into an issue, like you could make the right decision, but it's always helpful to be able to turn back to someone who's going through or experiencing the same thing and be like, what do you think? Even if it isn't an issue that Franny has dealt with, I imagine her background and being in the same business model is super helpful just to talk to someone about those kind of things. Yeah. I mean, it sets people up for success and saves them. I mean, they each have their own rep that they have access to all the time that is going to help them communicate. And we have weekly calls, you know, where our executive team is always meeting with them. I think one other really cool thing, and, and this is great because it's so business focused, but um, I'm going to reiterate what I did in my Ted talk in 2018. The first time I publicly spoke and it was illegal then. And I was getting threats that the DEA was going to come burn my farm, my crop. And I said, you know, at the end of this, that I believe that this crop is going to save our agro economies. So it's more than just franchising. And went back to what we were talking about earlier, Kellen, like with uh, carbon sequestering, We are going to see a revitalization across the entire country for agro communities and growers and farmers that we've never seen before. It is never going to be a profit driven. It's never going to be as profitable as tobacco. There never will be again, but it revitalizes business and industry that connects us to the land. And that is a new opportunity for businesses as I have converted and seen so many farms, we have helped convert them into hemp. That too is a business. And it's so beautiful how it all is one, but so many different parts, you know, just like our human body. We're all in this one meat sack, but it takes a whole lot of moving parts and organs inside to make it happen. Amazing. So Franny, for our listeners that want to learn more, they want to get touched, where can they reach you? So I'm kind of everywhere. Uh, You can even ask, somebody asked um, Alexa the other day, who is Franny Tacey. Oh, Alexa, pause. Sorry. (laughs) Now she's listening Uh, to our conversation. But Franny'sPharmacy.com, and we spell pharmacy, F-A-R-M-A-C-Y. Put in the farm and pharmacy. Franny'sPharmacy.com is really the host and home for where everything is. But if you want to stay on the farm, you can go to Franny'sFarm.com. You can look me up as a female entrepreneur. I have my whole perspective on just business, and that's Franny Tacey. Um, And we are Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, everywhere. 
And also in March, you can see me all over the country. I speak all over the country. I'm keynote speaking in an alternative products expo in Fort Lauderdale at the beginning of March and NOCO at the end of March. And I think that's when we're all going to be listening to this. So come see me. Awesome. Yeah, we'll link it up in the show notes. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you, Fran. Thank you.